You're watching Medfield TV. Welcome everyone to the January 21st Medfield Board of Selectmen's meeting. Uh, again, as we always start these meetings, just to remind everybody in the room, this meeting is being video recorded and broadcast by Medfield TV. Uh, so if you do have comments from the audience, we'd ask you to identify yourself and your address here in Medfield. Also, uh, if you're going to talk, please grab that microphone that's over on the table there. Uh, it's not a microphone for helping us hear you here in the room. It's for picking up the audio feed for Medfield TV. So you won't hear your voice amplified, but it's important to have the microphone. Uh, we also typically start our meetings asking everyone just to uh, take some time to think about the service members we have who are serving to protect the country uh, ac across the globe. Uh, I want to do something a little different. This is certainly not to detract from that piece of this, uh, but I want to share publicly with, and hopefully for anybody who's watching on TV, a memo that I think all three of us and Christine got from Chief Carrico this, uh, this past week uh, relating an incident. Uh, we were actually providing mutual aid to Dover, uh, and I won't go into the full details of what happened, but there was a <coughs> six-year-old girl who had a serious accident in her kitchen. Nothing, you know, just an accident in her kitchen. Uh, we had uh, Eric Littman, firefighter paramedic, uh, Thomas Cronin, firefighter EMT, uh, and Lieutenant Michael Harmon responded to that, were able to provide uh, treatment on the spot. The, the, the injuries would have been serious enough <coughs> that this could have been a very bad situation. Uh, instead, the prognosis is that this little girl will uh, have a full recovery. And uh, I think sometimes things like this happen in our community. We don't expect them and we don't hear about them. And we should not take for granted the people, not only the people who risk their lives to protect us across the world, but the people who develop the skills to save the lives of people here in our midst who get hit with something that nobody could have seen coming. So I just wanted to include that if we could all just take a minute to think of our appreciation for all of them. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we don't have anyone signed up for citizen comments, so our first appointment for the evening is from the Council on Aging to discuss the need to build a garage at the center. So take it away, Council on Aging. Yeah, that's your option. If you don't want to use that microphone, you can come up to the podium and use that microphone. So. You're old like me. It helps to sneak <laughs> now. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bob Heald. I'm the chairman of Class 1 Aging. Um, Ivy Robinson, a member of the council board, is here, as well as Roberta Lynch, who is the uh, as senior center director. 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 That's the one. Okay. Um, I thought we'd give you a little bit of history before uh, I get into the needs directly. The Council on Aging began talking about a garage back in 2011. And in 2012, Mr. Fellini, who was then chairman of the board, approached Dan Meas, the architect for the building down on Ice House Road. In February of 2012, Mr. Meas provided us with drawings and pricing for a three-bay garage. The price of 281764 was way out of our reach. The garage was then tabled. <coughs> and at that time, and still to this day, we thought we needed more space down at the senior center because the rooms were all full and we didn't have enough room for our program. So we went to town meeting with an article to build an addition. Um, <clears throat> this this, this uh, article failed the town meeting, so we kind of abandoned that idea for a while and turned our attention back to the much needed garage. In November of 2018, we received a quote for a garage, one with no bells or whistles, just a plain old garage. And this is $125,300. That being more in our wheelhouse, we met last year with the Permanent Building Committee and we're told that our project was not one that they would take on, but we said, you know, help us where do we go from here. They told us to hire a site engineer 
to draw our site plan, which we did. Dan O'Driscoll did this for us. Uh, and that's in your, in your, that's the big piece in your package there. Find an architect, architect which we did. Uh, Jeff Gnarly, we met with, and he provided us with his proposal. His proposal was all. <clears throat> when we um, forwarded this, in, in order to go forward with the architect, he was, he was looking for some payment up front and then payment when he finished. So we submitted it to Town Hall and, and they said, well, we don't kind of do it that way. Besides which, you need to come to the selectmen to get permission to build the garage. Okay, so here we are. Why do we want to build the garage? We have three town vehicles, three buses down there that are out in the elements. We would like a place to house them. Um, the, especially this time of the year with the snow and whatnot, it's very difficult to get that snow off the roof of the, of the buses. Um, and it's also not good for the buses to be out you know, 365 days a year. So we feel that if we have a garage be undercover, they should last longer. Secondly, the need for additional storage space down there. Our storage space is, in the building is, is, is full. Um, and some of it, which is located up on the second floor, there's a, a uh, stairway like this, goes straight up and very, very dangerous to be climbing up, down it, quite honestly. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the other thing is that Fosse, which is the Friends of Medfield Seniors, has raised money, and it is along with money they've raised and money that are available in certain funds that we have under the Council of Aging, we're not asking the town for any money to build this garage. So I just want to make that clear. Um, anything you want to add, Roberta? Um, no, just we've talked about this before. Oh, just, you know, the building is 12 years old now. We've been in 12 years. It's, we have over 1,060 people coming into the building unduplicated. We have between 90 and 120 people that come in uh, daily, except for Fridays. We have about 65 to 70 because it's a half day. So it's a pretty busy space. We have, we have, you know, you accumulate things that you use um, every year, at different times during the year for storage. So our storage is at um, uh, we have no more storage. We have a shed out uh, to the left of the building that houses our all our medical equipment. Last year we get, um, loaned out about 180 pieces of medical equipment. Equipment goes out, comes in, um, and we also have the voting booths in the shed that takes up a lot of room. Um, so the shed is is t is tapped out. I mean, it real. We have to throw. Last year we. We brought a whole bunch of uh, medical equipment to the transfer station to their metal pile because we just hadn't we had to get rid of some of it. Um, and Did you the, say uh, the voting booths are in your? We shed? have voting booths in our shed. Yeah, yes. and honestly, um, clearing off the roof of those buses. Now this has been a very light um, winter as so far. Hopefully it'll continue. But you know the winter of 2015 really did me and personally with the, the snow on those buses, shoveling out the buses. The DPW does a great job plowing the parking lot for us, but we still have to dig those buses out. Um, and it's, you know, uh, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot of work, um, for myself and staff and, and, you know, uh, it comes out of my budget because I've added money to my budget for the snow shoveling and the clearing off of the sidewalk so forth. So I think that for the buses, anyhow, it would be great. They, the longevity of the buses, it would be, uh, they would last longer. We wouldn't have the problem with the snow on the roof because it is illegal to drive vehicles with snow on the roof. And the big bus is quite high, so it's very hard to get all the snow off. And it's something that um, we've talked about for a long time since two, 2011, obviously. Um, and, you know, we ha I think we have the funds. We'd at least like, I'd like to go 
forward with the architect so we could draw the plan and actually get the pricing of what the garage would cost. Um, I can't give a ballpark figure on that. I, I don't know, but when I spoke with uh, Mr. Gnarly, when we met with him, he said that it was a pretty straightforward, simple construction. He didn't expect it to be very expensive whatever that means, but it's probably not, we can't afford the 281000 that the quote that we got in 2012. So um, we'd like at least to move forward to see what the building will cost, and then Fossey and the COA can look together and see, you know, do it. I think we might need some help with maybe the site work, uh, like DPW helped us with the site work for our um, addition to our concrete patio many years ago. They helped with the site work to our bocce court. Um, so something like that might be uh, needed as a kind of an in-kind help, um, but I think that's it. Unfortunately, nothing's easy when you're talking public construction, and there's a fairly low threshold before you're going to trigger at least public construction laws for purposes of, of uh, bidding the project. You might be able, at the very least, to get, because of the relatively small involved, maybe not required to comply with the design or selection statute. A, a feasibility study would determine that, because it's all based on the pricing, whether that triggers that statute in the first place, which is requiring it to get an architect or an engineer to do the plans. But ultimately, unless it's a, a very low project, you, you probably have to at least comply with General Laws 3039M, which is for small construction, or full-blown Chapter 149, if if it if that's triggered. And I don't have the figures off the top of my head to know whether it is or it isn't. But that that's has to do with comp competing for the contract. Publication, yeah. bid out on the street, comp you know, response to that. There is also a, there's a simplified procedure for modular construction. I don't know if that's what they're actually looking at is a we modular. Talked about that. But even that, there is a process that has to be followed. Mm -hmm. You can't just go ahead and you know go out and get a contract and build a garage. Yeah, we, we, we can't even determine that because we need to have an architect draw up something so that we can find out what it's going to cost. I mean, if it's going to cost three hundred thousand, we're not doing. It. Well, you could, like I said, you could do a feasibility study or conceptual something very preliminary, get a handle on the figures, and go from there. So, who so, does that? How do you do that? What was the, the quote from your What was the quote they, from your architect for there? We, we don't have one for the fee for the architect. Oh, it was under five thousand dollars. Well, that's that's under for design, so that's way under for design and selection. But again, it's step at a step. It's a step. Ultimately, any kind of construction on uh, on public property, short of pure volunteer, you know, where people volunteered absolutely everything, you have to comply with one or another of those construction statutes. But I, I don't see that as being a big. If you can get the design, if you right. if you don't have to go through the drawing and design, what you're talking about is competing. Or, you comp a competing a construction contract that has a design for a small, even if it was the larger amount, I mean, unless you've got somebody who's already come forward and said, I'll build it for you, and that's who you're trying to steer it to, you are happy enough to just compete it and find the, the lowest cost legitimate builder that's willing to put it up. So the fact that you have to put, the, put a solicitation out, that's paperwork. Well, it's more than that, unfortunately. It has to be spec'd. Has to be somebody has to a garage, come. but but I mean it's a garage. It's a that's what I'm saying. If it's, if they can get away with a modular unit, it may simplify it. If they're actually going to design a garage, believe me, as simple as it seems to be, it's not. But what does that mean, though, Mark? I mean, is it, obviously public buildings get built, you, right? right? So it's not an impossible thing to actually no, build a public but, building. But so for they, relatively small projects, are the yeah. ones that are the biggest inefficiency, if you will. But you're going to have to, you don't just put out a contract and say, we want a garage X number of feet by X number of feet. Everything has to be spec'd in that garage. So somebody has to prepare those, those bid docs to go out on the street. I think that's the second step in this process. I think the first step is the council on aging just needs to find out 
based on the on the five thousand they want to spend for the architect, what's the cost of the building, and should we even move forward? Can they afford it? I, I, so I think that's right. Can, can they go ahead with that, Mark? Without yeah. okay. So then that seems to be the question here, because I think there's 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 that issue. Then there's this, the general question, depending on what the cost is, is that sort of the best use of money, right, to do that. I know you think it is. This is your number one priority, the only thing you want to build for the next 10 years, and I get it. But we'll have to make that. We'll have to make, well. <laughs> it's anything like that. Right, well. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think I'm happy to have you spend the $5,000 to get the design. I'm not sure I think this is necessarily something you should build because we, we did about 10 years ago spend about $10 plus million plus to build a pretty nice garage in the town. And so I'd like to see what other options were considered and evaluated for storing these buses other than building a new building there. Because everybody in every department wants their own thing they control, right? Everybody in every department wants their own thing that they control, that they're in charge of, that's their very own. And so what you end up with is a lot of public money being spent on a lot of different things. And I realize you've raised this money. I get that you've raised this money. And if this money has been donated specifically for a garage and can only be spent upon a garage, then it's got to be spent upon a garage. If it's general money that you've raised that you can use for anything, then if you spend it on a garage, you can't spend it on something else, right? When you can't Correct. spend it twice. And so we have to just think about w what that next ask is going to be because you, you can't have a situation where we'll spend the money today and then five years from now we'll have an emergency situation that could have been planned for, could have been addressed, could have been saved for, but now you say, well, we have to spend this money five years from now because, well, we didn't have anything left. Right. So I'm happy to have the $5,000 spent. You're going to have to persuade me that this is a good use of that money and that there aren't well, better uses of what. this money. No, skip it. I don't say that. Yeah, say whatever you want. No, I was, I was going to say you can come down and help me shovel out the buses if you want with the big snowstorm. But I think we found other alternatives for the buses that you don't like, but we have found other alternatives. For one bus. It's just for one bus. Only one bus can fit in that tent up at the uh, transfer station. And how many buses go out the morning after a storm? We often have two on the road. Right, so we have to figure, compare what the alternatives are for where you can park the buses, for how you can get the snow off the buses versus what the cost of the garage. I'm not unalterably opposed to the garage. If this is what your priority is, I'm, you know, I'm willing to defer to a certain point, recognizing that from my perspective, and I'm not going to be here that long, but from my perspective, this will be it from built for building for the council and aging building for the foreseeable future um, because we have a lot of other priorities in town a lot of this needs to be built your building is only 12 years old and maybe it should have been built bigger in the first instance but you know, that's water under the bridge and so I wasn't here then either so I Mike's raising the issue of one other uh, uh, building in town that houses uh, uh, vehicles I, I guess I can think of a second one I wasn't even thinking of the t of the tent down by the transfer station uh, are, are, do we have any room, uh, Chris, in either of the, uh, the public safety building or the uh, town garage for these vehicles? There's no room in the public safety. I believe that when we met with Mo, Mo came up with the idea of putting them at the transfer station. Okay. But I, I'm not going to speak for him. No room at the inn? <laughs> <laughs> um. We, um, with our stormwater management, we have all our equipment inside. Each, each garage do door is filled with all our vehicles, all our equipment that goes out for snow and ice. Um, we did speak to about this. We discussed this. Um, it's one of those things where, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, to accommodate other vehicles in there when we're conducting a snow and ice. It is, it's, you know, the council on aging is not open at that time, and I understand that. But to take up a, uh, the bays, three bays in the, in the garage, that means all our, those trucks have to be outside um, before the storm. Putting the plows on and everything else has to be done outside because we do put the plows on inside. But, um, you know, we, if we offered it to one, we should offer it to all, all the different activities in town as well. The schools, the, the uh, park and rec, um, not only just the Council on Aging, but, you know, we're trying to do the best we can, but, I mean, if that's the decision of the board, that's the decision of the board, but, um, you know, we'll do whatever we need to do, but I'd, I would rather not 
use the garage for different purposes at this time. So I guess, Mo, what I'm hearing you say is that it's a question of convenience for the DPW to not have additional vehicles there, but there is space, it sounds like. Well, I mean, anything's possible. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I think I also heard you say that if you pull them out, you're putting plows on in the snow outside. So, you know, I, if there's an option here for, a, you know, a town facility, that's one thing, but we designed the DPW garage, I think, to meet the needs of the DPW. We didn't add three or four extra bays even for, maybe we did, but I, I don't think we added bays for growth. No, actually we took bays away. That's right, because of the wetlands, I think, so. No, it was because of money went in there. Because, okay. Uh, okay, so the wetlands was just a limit on how far one wing could go. In the first. My point is that if we built a building to meet a need to start to shoehorn other needs in, if that, if, if we can do it, that's great. But if that starts pushing you to where you're doing things, the whole reason we built the building the way it was was so we didn't have to have vehicles out in the snow and the rain exposed to the weather. And I think probably that would include having to put plows on out in a snowstorm. Uh, or once you've done that, leaving the vehicle idling while the snow is coming down. The whole point of the wings was so you wouldn't have to do those kinds of things. So. I'm not, I'm not categorically ruling it out. I'm just saying let's not lose sight of why we built the building in the first place. And then if there's a smart way to use it, that's fine. But otherwise, let's not go there. Um, I have, a, I have a, a, a softer position on where you're coming from. First off, I think for our purposes today, the issue is you need our endorsement of being able to go out and get the preliminary engineering done. It'll cost about $5,000, and we'll take a vote. But I think I haven't heard violent objections to that. Um, I hear Mike's objection. It's not an objection. It's a concern. Well, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not categorically opposed to it. I'm just saying we can't... We can't do any building or any project that just right. looks immediately at what's in front of us. I think, frankly, that's kind of what we did with the DPW garage. There was no extra play in the joints there. And now, you know, gee, things have changed. We might like to have a little extra space there. But since we shrank it down, now we don't have that. And so when you build a building that's going to be there for 50 or 75 years, building it to the bare minimum specification for what you need at this particular point in time is, is – Penny wise and pound foolish. And I'm sure that was, we thought we were being super fiscally conservative at the time, but it's not. It's going to cost us more money in the long run. So I'm not categorically opposed to this. I, I don't think we should have snow on the buses. All I'm saying is that if the issue is working out differences between departments or being a little bit flexible, I'd rather see that money go towards programs and other things at the Council on Aging than go towards a garage if we can find another solution. If the issue is, look, we just don't have enough space because we didn't have enough foresight to build extra space eight years ago, then okay, that bad, bad on us, and this is the best use of their money. So I'm not categorically opposed to it. I just think it's a broader discussion than we have money, we want to spend it on this. That's all. So, so if we were talking about town money being spent to do this, I would 100% agree with you? Because we're, I think, talking FOSI money to do this, I 75% agree with you. And, and here's why. Um, it's pretty good, actually. Quite a, yeah, yeah, we're not usually <laughs> that close to it. Um, and the reason is FOSI money is people in town, or maybe not all even in town, who care about the Council on Aging program, who, who have, many of them, I think, have benefited from it. And because they've benefited from it, they've donated to it. I don't know that any of them donated with this with the specific tag of <clears throat> this is money for a garage, but I'm guessing some of them, if they'd known that that was going to be a, a hinge point on a decision, probably would have done that. And my my main point is, people when they donate to things like that, they do it because there's something about the program that they appreciate, value, and have decided to voluntarily spend money on. And I would, in that sense, I'm hesitant as a board of selectmen to sit there and second guess. I'm not saying we don't review it, have to review it, but I'm hesitant to second guess the decisions that the Council on Aging makes using money that's been donated by people who I suspect will continue to donate to the Council on Aging, especially if they see the things that the Council on Aging really wants. So. Where Mike was not absolutely ruling it out, I'm not absolutely saying let's go ahead with it, but I think the fact that this is a source of money that's 
from people who care about this particular program and probably would trust the, the board and the leaders of the program to know where it's most needed, I would at least weigh that heavily in my own views on that when, when we get to the point where that's even an issue. I think um, the majority of this money was raised uh, with the Fosse Challenge, which was several years ago. And at the time, we were hoping to put an addition onto the building. Mm -hmm. So they were aware that we were looking for bricks and mortar, um, and that, that's been turned down. I'm a little bit concerned about your comment that if we build this garage, that that's going to push any further um, construction at the senior center down the road another 10 years or whatever. I don't know exactly what you said. But I don't think this should be at all related to that. This is a totally independent kind of thing. You know, it's, it's, we're not asking the town for the money. We're asking just from, for permission to do it. Can I ask a question? Yes. Will the town be responsible for the maintenance once the garage is up? Painting it, taking care of it. Is there going to be heat in it? Electricity? There will I, be electricity. There will be no heat. And you don't know yet if it's going to need to be painted on a annual basis or well, what? Well, I think that all depends on what the architect. But there could be or will be maintenance costs associated with it in addition to electricity. There will be some maintenance costs. Of course, costs there will be some maintenance costs. So the town is going to have to spend money on the project. So. Right, and, and to my point earlier, I mean, if, if, if your real priority is an addition, right, this is money that could be tr contributed to an addition instead of this. That, that's what I'm getting at when I say you're not going to do anything else for it. You know, this is your building project. This is great. We obviously have a number of other priorities with buildings that are much, much older than the Council on Aging building. And so if you're going to spend the money that you have on this project, I think that you're saying this is the project we think is important. We want to put all this money towards it. And I'm just saying as we think about our capital building project going forward, that that's that's going to be sort of what you get in this window of time because your building is so new well obviously we think it's important we've and we thought about it going back to 2011 after being in the building for three years and having worked with the buses in the winter and the snow so this is not something that has just come out two years ago mm -hmm. this is something that has been an ongoing conversation with the council on aging board and members of the council on aging um, for a very long time. So now uh, Fosse has did their fundraising. The, the Council on Aging has accumulated um, monies from donations, as uh, Mr. Murby says. Um, our respite group uh, program is a, a generates revenue. Um, and so one of those, bu that bus that goes and picks people up in Medfield to bring them to the program um, would be protected by the garage. So some of the money that we've accumulated in that account can be used towards um, the garage. So it's not, so it, I'm just saying it's not something that we just, it's a whim. It's been thought about and talked about for many years. No, I'm not suggesting it's a whim. I'm just saying, that we, again, we can't look at any building project, any capital investment we make in isolation, and then move three years from now and look at something else in isolation. So if this is sort of the priority in the next window, then that weighs, you know, to Gus's point, more heavily with me as well, saying this is what we're going to do. But I'll just say that, that if you're two years from now looking for an addition, the fact that you did this now, I mean, again, the fact that the building's only 12 years old is the first problem, but the second problem would be you just did a garage. Right, whereas you could have saved up towards an addition if that's what your real priority is. Well, I think it's great that you have given us the okay to move forward and... Um, not, yet, not yet, we haven't, but I no, think... No, you haven't? Will. <laughs> oh, you will. Well, I thought you insinuated that. So I, I did, but only that that's right. Don't, don't talk us out of it. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to probably move this along. Okay. So I, I think it's a good idea. If you guys... Uh, I, I love the fact that you've raised the money yourselves, and if you want to use your money to build a garage, I, I, I don't want to stand in the way of that. Um, I would throw out a, and, and I, I was curious to see whether there were other places in town to park the vehicle since the town does have a bunch of garages. I would throw out another idea for you, which is that uh, your, your parking lot is perfect for a solar array. You're going to have a solar array across the, the parking lot at the Kingsbury Club soon. If you park your uh, buses under a solar array, like over at uh, REI in Framingham, you basically have a a canopy over your buses for the winter um, and so that the snow would just slide off towards the uh, south, uh, towards the uh, 
the front of the building. Um, so that, you know, and you can get a solar array without, depending on how you do it, you, you can get it at no cost to the council on aging. Um, I mean, the town is making some good money on its uh, uh, solar arrays at the wastewater treatment plant and the and the uh, DPW build. No, it's the public safety public safety building. We're looking to put one at the at Moe's building. Um, just a thought for you. I mean, some some companies will come in and put it up at no cost to you at all, and then you get less return on the electricity generated. So I think, just to summarize this so we can move on, I think that the, the specific request you're coming here with, we'll know in a minute, but I think probably you'll get a, recep a good reception to that. My guess is that you don't inherently have a burning desire as a Council on Aging to go out building garages. So to the extent that Mike and Pete's ideas of alternatives is a way to avoid putting money into a garage that might be better put into an actual facility, that's useful advice and I suspect you don't have to be convinced a lot to take that seriously. Um, and when you come up with whatever the cost of the garage is, that gives everybody a lot better information. Um, I would say to Christine's point that one of the things the town's trying to do is to look beyond the immediate acquisition of, an, of a resource to really take into account the cost to the town, especially if it's a cost that shows up in the budget. Uh, so probably by the time we would get down that far in the process as part of thinking or making the case if you choose to build a garage and if you have a price, part of what the question that would come with that is and what's your projected maintenance costs and what are you proposing, how do you propose that those maintenance costs be covered? Uh, and that, I don't put it that way to say, and don't dare say the town has to do it. I'm just saying whatever the scheme is, we need to know that too before we'd probably be prepared to make a final decision on the whole thing. With that, we have a motion. Um, what, what are we, are we asking? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're, we're moving to authorize them to, uh, to retain an architecture. <laughs> Move a cer up to a certain amount for preliminary study for uh, five, I think it was five thousand dollars. Up to five thousand. So I, I move that we uh, allow the Council on Aging to spend up to five thousand dollars for for preliminary studies. Second. Okay, and I've learned almost at the end of one year of being a chair that it's the clerk that's supposed to run these votes. So take it away, Pete. Oh no no no! That's just oh meeting. just for that one. Oh, no, just in the executive. Session. Okay, all those in favor. <laughs> Aye. Yep. Aye. Opposed. Ayes have you. it. Passes. Thank you. What, what's your <laughs> timetable? Like, when do you think you'll have a design? Like, how long did they say it would take? I don't recall that. Okay. A month? Uh, you don't know. I don't know. Okay. I mean, do you think you'd be looking to build it like this summer? Or what's the, like, before next winter? Is so, that the. Well, we, we <clears throat> that proposal from Mr. Narley for a few months now. Um, so we'll have to be in touch with them and see, of course, if he's still interested. Mm -hmm. Nice price for the sign of the building. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, people will be able to see it's going to be for us. Presumably, you get it designed. Would you be looking to get it, the garage itself built you know, before next winter? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So roughly or so. All right. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Got a lot of buildings up in the state hospital. There must be one we <laughs> put a car in there. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. All right. Our next item on the agenda is uh, Michael Taylor here to discuss a proposal for the Clark Tavern. Mike Taylor, I chair the Historic District Commission. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Um, I actually, I'm here really to present some good near, near news regarding the tavern. Um, in the last uh, decade or so, there's been three different owners. Um, we've heard proposals of an assisted living facility wanting to put a large complex in the back. 
and then they were going to spend a million dollars and allow some of the town organizations to, they were going to fix up the, the tavern and let the, the town use uh, the space, the historical society, things like that. Then there was another, the Leonard's bought it, they, they decided to try to turn it into a tavern. As part of that process, um, they did extensive interior gutting. They tore out um, a lot of the, the walls and the, uh, the plaster, and all the doors are apparently missing. So then there was uh, the third owner came along, and as you know, they, they tried to do uh, another assisted Alzheimer, I believe it was an Alzheimer center, and that ultimately failed. And here we have this uh, house sitting there. The only good thing that's happened to it is someone put a new roof on, which is great. But before we get to the good news, um, let me just explain you know, what, the, uh, what our uh, commission does. I repre uh, represent the, the historic district commission. There's two historical commissions in town. The one I don't represent is the one David Temple in Bible run. That's the, um, that's the commission that does the demolition delay bylaw. Okay, so for instance, if someone wanted to tear the, the tavern down, right, um, the town can stop that process for, for 18 months, and then if the developer out, out, you know, is willing to wait, the, the tavern can be torn down. Uh, the, we, have a, we have something called a, um, an historic district bylaw that allows the town to create historic districts. We have four of them in town. If we were able to create an historic district on that side of, of Main Street, and we actually had a proposal. We've been trying. This is something we've been trying to do for 17 years, um, almost as long as the hospital. Uh, but but start uh, back in 2003, we had proposed uh, uh, creating a historic district on that side of uh, uh, Main Street, essentially going from the Morse Homestead at the beginning of Pound Street, and that's why you have those maps there to show you what we were thinking, going all the way down to the Baptist Church. Um, and Lords, and at the at Lords and Avenue, that's the beginning of the town center historic district. So, 17 years ago, we presented the plan to neighbors. The neighbors really weren't supportive of it at all. They didn't like our guidelines. They they didn't want to become part of historic districts. We listened. We changed the guidelines. We created a mechanism to allow, um, you know, if someone didn't like a, a review we did, they could challenge it and. Uh, and, uh, and overturn it without bringing it to superior court. But anyway, to make long story short, um, we, we, we were, we'd, when we saw that the uh, tavern was going up for sale again, um, we, we, and with the turnover of some of the residents in um, East, call it East Main Street, we decided that we should try creating this historic district. So we had two meetings. We had a meeting in December. We had a meeting in January. During the December meeting, um, and I'll get to the good news in a moment. But in the December meeting, basically the residents who did attend were generally not supportive. Although opinions vary, the general uh, consensus, you know, it, it relates to the tavern. I, I understand that. All right, moving on. <laughs> For those who are watching and wondering, the actual agenda item we have is to talk about the Clark Tavern, <coughs> not to talk about the historic district, so we don't want to get into a detailed discussion of the historic right. district, right. only because it's not on the agenda. Right. Um, another exactly. time, if you'd wanted to do that, just make sure the agenda item was clear. Right. Okay. <coughs> Besides, we only want to hear the good news. Why don't we <laughs> just hit us with the good news? <laughs> All right. So I'll come back to tell you the bad news then. But the good news is that uh, between the two meetings that we were having, um, the, uh, we got a request from Dave and Rob McCready, and I must point out that, that the uh, McCready's, they're the ones that did the avenue um, in town, across the way, and I think they had, a, quite frankly, when we had one of our, uh, uh, during the, the first meeting, they were very supportive of what the Stork District Commission does. But in any event, they have, a, they have a signed purchase and sale agreement with the current owner of the tavern. They plan to move the tavern, they'd like to move the tavern close to the road. It's obviously not co cost economical just to renovate the tavern. So they have a plan to, to add some units in the back, bring the, the tavern close to the road, add some units in the back. Um, 
And to do that, they're, they're, they're going to need ZBA approval. But before they started spending money on architectural drawings, they wanted to get feedback from the two historical commissions. <coughs> and uh, so a joint meeting between this, uh, the two commissions were held on January 15th. And both commissions voted unanimously to support the conceptual design as presented. The Peak House Heritage Center and nearby residents also approved the plan. In fact, in a room filled with probably 25 people, there was no opposition. The, 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 the McCready's would, would not object to, the, to uh, there being an historic district. We wanted to create one, but I guess that's part two of the story. So um, I'm not really here to explain you know, the details of the plan. In fact, quite frankly, it was much more conceptual. Credits are here, uh, both uh, Dave and Rob, and I just wanted to thank them for coming up with a solution. I think that the town will be very pleased with. Thank you. Could could I just sure. ask one point of clear? So, in making this presentation, is there any action, any react reaction, anything you need from us, or is it just basically letting us know that that's the well? The purpose of the meeting was to get feedback on the the. Uh, peak at the Peak House Historic District, but since okay. you're not al allowed to discuss it, I really can't ask for your input. So you're not looking for in our input on the Clark right. Tavern as a project, but a broader set of uh, the. Uh, <coughs> I, 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 it became an informational um, piece. I mean, I, obviously the McCready's they they want to do this project. They don't want to do it if the historical commissions don't support it. They do. They wouldn't want to do it if the residents don't support it as they they didn't support some of the other plans. The residents do support it. The a Peak House um, Heritage Group Center, I think it's called, they support it. I think everyone supports it. So it's obviously sometimes the devil's in the details, but they're going to get, they're going to need the town, um, in particular the ZBA, to approve the plan. So we, I, we just think it's a very good development. Okay. Could, could someone, maybe either uh, uh, Mike or, or, or Dave or Rob, explain exactly what it is other than moving the Clark Tavern to the, yeah, closer Mark, to the street and adding some other units? Yeah, so do you need a variance to move it closer to the roadway? Or are you going to still be within the front setback? Uh, <clears throat> our plan now... Our Dave, can you just use the microphone? That lets people at home hear you, what you're uh -huh. saying. In developing our plans, um, we're told to not ask for to not need a variance, we need to meet the side, front, and rear setbacks for the zone that it's in, which is IRS. So we're, our plans that are very preliminary, we're working within that, those boundaries, and I think it's going to work. So what do you need from the ZBA? Uh, use. Oh, okay. So it's a historic, it's a historic properties bylaw then? Yes. And what we're looking for, too, as we're working on the purchase and sales now um, and the timing of it all. And we want to be sure before we go forward and do all the engineering that everybody wants it because it's not a by right. It's, um, it's something. It's a special permit. A special permit. And if people don't support it, there's no use. So, so you've got room to move the house closer to the street and still stay within the setback? Correct. And it sounds like you're going to add some additional units as well, or what's uh, the ultimate we're, use going to be? To, our plan is to rebuild the tavern into two units, which I believe it was at one time, uh, and they will be 2,400-ish square feet each with two-car garage, which is pretty much what the building is now. <coughs> and Behind the tavern would have three units, three detached outbuilding type that uh, Dave Scharf has started to design, which seemed to be well received, the concept. But that's what we need, and we also need the support to, to get the permit. So the historic properties bylaw allows the ZBA to grant a special permit with all kinds of conditions to make, basically make any kind of use available to them, provided they keep the main building in existence. Mm -hmm. 
The problem that originally arose with the Clark Tavern with the original proposal was they needed more than that. They needed uh, dimensional relief, and so the ZBA took it upon itself without actually granting variances, tried to do it under the auspices of that historic properties bylaw, which frankly doesn't address that, and that led to court action. Other comments or questions? No. I, um, and I would just point the big difference <coughs> here between the, the tavern and the <coughs> this plan is you got neighborhood support going in, in the get-go. So the odds of this thing succeeding is much greater. So not to push back or I, I I've heard from at least one person in the neighborhood that was not supportive. So I, only for purposes of the public. I don't want to convey an impression here that somehow or another there's been a vote of the neighbors and it's 100% unanimous. I, I'm not, I also haven't heard an overall, it sounds like most are, so I'm, I'm not trying to trash that. The only thing I just don't want to convey the wrong impression in this meeting that somehow or another that's there. If there are, in this process, if there are neighbors who have objections, I assume that the it would be a ZBA meeting that they'd Voice, so they have an opportunity to publicly object if they would. I do, my impression is that the majority would not object. Uh, without knowing exactly what your design is, my guess is the town is a town, would be happy to know that we found a way to preserve the Clark Tavern. So on the, at that level of uh, the project, it sounds like you figured out a potential way to solve a problem that we've been wrestling with for years, and it sounds like the historic Commissions agree with that, so uh, yeah. there's okay. no action on our part. Nope. Thank you. Thanks for letting us know. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> uh, next item is the Friends of the Medfield Rail Trail. Uh, Christian Donner, I think you're the one who's up requesting permission to apply for a mass trails grant on behalf of the town, uh, requesting the selectmen to vote to sign a letter of support for that grant. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. We hope it will be a successful one and we have a breakthrough finally for the Red Trail. Um, so you mentioned the two agenda items that I uh, requested. The first one is the um, permission to apply for a grant on behalf of the town from the Mass Trails program that we did twice already. So we did it two years ago where we got $100,000 contingent on construction starting and then last year we did not win um, any money and but the feedback was positive and supportive so that we decided we would like to do it again this year we are applying for another hundred thousand dollars I believe you received the draft proposal I mean I know you did <clears throat> today too late probably for before the meeting to look at it I have a I have a copy if you would like to see a, a draft copy. I have one printed out here, but it is. Would you? We, well, we have one copy here. Oh, you do. You're okay. right. We, it showed up late, so <coughs> if either of you read All right. it, I haven't. It was not in. I don't think it was in the. So it is. You know, we, we we incorporated the feedback that we received from from Amanda Louise last year that was mainly around connections to other um, um, trails uh, and, and, and in town connections and. Um, and we think we have uh, you know, a better uh, proposal um, for this year. And um, the only other thing that changed was we have more money. We raised another forty-ish thousand dollars um, on our own, so we are at um, seventy-two thousand right now, plus a hundred thousand, one hundred and seventy. We get another hundred thousand. We think we can complete both <coughs> phases of the of the scope that we had envisioned for. So that's the. I think you'll have to vote on it. Questions, comments? No. The only question I have, uh, not necessarily expecting an update on the lease, but is is this grant at all, or did the or last year's grant request was it hurt by the fact that we haven't signed a lease yet, or is it tied to a lease? The, the lease. I don't think so. Um, we, I don't think we've received specific feedback to that, and, and, and um, um, James Goldstein, who, who worked 
uh, was instrumental on the submission last year, knows the answer to that best. Um, James? Hi, man. <coughs> <coughs> Ultimately, we of course will be the town to sign the lease, <coughs> and um, we have, and we hope that uh, that will happen. As you know, there are questions that um, town council has raised about the insurance provisions. Those are in discussion now. Uh, we've communicated uh, those concerns and are awaiting response. But we assume they will be resolved in the next few months. <coughs> okay, I, I just want to. It's one of those things where I hope this works too, and I hope that some of the onerous clauses can be eliminated or otherwise modified. But so it's not an issue of not wanting this. I just want to know how, whether there was only kitchen or not. Not explicitly, but ultimately yeah. it has to be. Um, okay. okay. I would, I would suggest where you haven't had a chance to read it that you authorize me to sign it, which I believe is what you did last year, and I signed it on behalf of what is left and you have a chance to read it. And that's the it. letter of support, I think? Or Correct. So yeah, okay, so that's the second one. For, you have, uh, part of the submission is letters of support from various constituents and the board of selectmen is one of them last year. Can I, actually, before, because there are two requests here, can I just stop for a second? Yes. And do we, the, the first was a request for us to grant permission for them to apply for the Mass Trails grant. And we <coughs> first just deal with that so that at least we have that piece of it done. And, and I, I would move that we uh, authorize them to apply for the grant. Okay. Is that the grant application or is that what we have been just That's what came from you. Have a so I, I'll second it. I think. Do, do we have to sign that grant or you're signing that? So in other words, there's two things. There's a letter of support that we're signing or Christine is signing. And then there's the well, grant Sarah, that we're allowing them to submit. Sarah proposal will submit. Um, there's nothing in there. I mean, my only concern is there's nothing in there committing the town to spend any money on this. Well, uh, once the, if you actually got the grant, then there'd be documents that would apply to you whatever. Sure. Uh, it's not a situation where we're applying for the grant and they give us a hundred grand, we also have to spend a hundred grand on it. No, there's a match requirement which we have. Um, which you've raised, then, right? Yes, yeah. so we, are, we, 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 are, we are above that, so that's not an issue. Yeah, I don't want to hold this up, I just want to make sure that when we read it, we're not going to have mm -hmm. any concerns that we have to. And, and, to, it, it and, to, and to go back, you said this is basically the same grant that we have already proved in the past, it's just you've strengthened some of the arguments. So this yeah. is actually something to do with it. Yeah, that's correct. Right. Okay. Okay. And we, did, we didn't sneak any sinister. We're so cautious about that supporter of select. Uh, okay, I have a motion to second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So that, we're, we're past the first part. Now let's get to the second part. Well, the second part should be easier because now that we know that we want to support, uh, we want to submit the, the application, we want to make it as strong as possible. So here we, have, we have a letter of support from, from the Council of Aging, um, from um, Planning Board, Planning Board um, the Great Friends. Up, a number of others. Yeah, so there's about six or seven of those, and it would be very appreciated. I would move that we uh, both, uh, write a letter of support for the grant. You have a letter of support. Before we do that, let me just clarify something. Christine, you you signed the letter of support last time. So are we moving to let Christine sign the letter of support? I think Christine has it right this there. The language. Like so this is so it would be the exact same letter of support that we did last year. Yes. Okay. If you want to look at it, anybody want to look at it? <laughs> well, no, I'm not done yet. Um, so well, Chris, Chris, Christine signed it last year. Does it matter in terms of the gravity of the letter of support, whether Christine signs it or whether we sign it? I don't think so. You don't think so? Okay. I'm signing it on their behalf. Exactly. So. Just making sure. Yeah. Just like, I mean, it's three signatures. Of course, it's town administrator signature. That's not probably easily worth three. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> we'll think about first supporting children if we fail to come through or anything like that. Second. I second. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Do you have any other questions that I
This time? Uh, okay. Yeah, at least that Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. All right. Uh, action items, any tolerance? Uh, just uh, hold right there. Can we have hold until the uh, February meeting? So we have, we have a series of proposals for energy conservation work, but that's being deferred. Uh, next item, Maurice Goulet, DPW Director, requests the Board of Selectmen to review and approve the new street sign design. Good evening. Um, this is Maurice Goulet. A little over a year ago, we, we discussed um, possibly changing the street signs in town, making them all consistent, uh, complying with NETCD, which is the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, which is, uh, uses the state standard. These uh, demonstrations in front of you, um, the first is, is a green sign with the old town Medfield seal. The second one, the second page is with the blue sign with the newer town uh, seal shown. Uh, Christine had contacted uh, Rich Disorder to uh, kind of discuss which town seal should be, would be appropriate for the town of to use. The, uh, his recommendation would be the, uh, the seal that's on the blue sign, the newer seal. And his question uh, to Christine also was, is there a possible way of changing the signs from green to blue? Uh, there are no regulations that say we can't do that. But I wanted to bring it to your attention to see what uh, what your thoughts were and which, uh, which way you wanted to go with these signs. So he recommended the seal on the blue version. The blue and the seal. But the blue and the seal. The blue is the disorder recommendation. Correct. That's his Correct. Yeah. And is there a rationale for the blue? Um, Medfield blue. He thought uh, it was Medfield identity, and when you were driving through town, it would be nice to see Medfield blue on our street. Walpole's the same color. Oh, and I talked about that. <laughs> but our blue might be slightly different because it's Medfield blue. <laughs> It'll be a better blue. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mo, um, with respect to the, the standard, so in, in what, what respects do our current street signs not comply with the standard? So, we have 80,000 variations of the street sign out there. If you go to every single street, it's different. Uh, we have capital letters, we have small letters, we have four inch blades, we have misspellings. It's just, it's just, yeah, <laughs> misspellings. Um, so we're trying to get a, a consistent sign throughout the town with the town seal. Um, and METCD rules and regs have more space around the lettering so it's easier to pick up the high reflect, uh, reflectivity signs, which will show up um, very vibrant in the, at night with the, with the headlights and everything. So um, it's, a, it's a kind of a win-win for the town with the, with the new sign. What's the cost of swapping out all the signs? So the total cost uh, would probably be around anywhere between thirty and thirty-five thousand uh, dollars. This will be spread out over, over the course of two to three years, not just to do it one year. We have um, our sign our sign maintenance every year. We we go through our highway budget, so we wouldn't be doing much more than we normally do. Throughout the course of the year, we're changing mode, but we would like to, in the next two to three years, have all the signs replaced. And there's a lot of them that need to be replaced. Maybe we can uh, offer to sell the old signs. We're just going to say that. Actually, that very, very we talked about how we could make this a revenue generator. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know we had two uh, town seals. That's interesting. The old one's easier to see. Actually, it's got a better contrast to it. The old seal uh, was what was developed because it was the easiest to put onto the vehicles. And that's what's on the vehicle. That's what's on the vehicle. Oh. But the official town seal that we use is the one that's on the vehicle. Why was it easier to run the vehicles? See it? Yeah, I think it was just, uh, it was probably cheaper at the time to do a less <laughs> color screen. <laughs> 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 and it tells you how old the vehicles are, too. Right. Further <laughs> 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 discussion? I don't think so. Yeah, I, you don't have a strong view about the blue versus the green. 
be inclined to defer to the judgment of our town historian who has graciously agreed to become our town historian again himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I don't have a, I don't have any reason to, to disagree with Mitchell. There are many reasons to agree with them on matters of history. And there's no difference in terms of how visible the street signs are. No, the whole high reflects it. Yeah, the size is the same. Yeah. You can paint this guy that will help you. All right, uh, do we, we just get to vote? Some of the stuff you get to do on this like you get to vote on this. This is like every sign that go by, it's going to be. Bust. <laughs> <laughs> or. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure when it gets changed to blue, there will be some objections. <laughs> well, 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 that's why I'm getting it. And you're going to send them to P.O. Box 2525 in Massachusetts. He can respond to you. What would we uh, authorize the, uh, the blue signs with the. Uh, New yes, yeah. the newer the newer seal. Yes. I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Walt. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Uh next item is the Council on Aging recommends the Board of Selectmen to vote to appoint Heidi Groff to their board. A second. All those in favor? Yeah. All right. And she's filling an open seat? Correct. There's a uh, open seat towards the Next item, selectmen are requested to vote to sign the MSBA contract for architectural services with Arrow Street Architects for the Dale Street Elementary School project. Um, I'm not sure I've actually, I, I read one document for our last meeting and then there were a whole bunch of other documents and what I saw with our package this time. So, was what's the real contract? So the contract that you read for the last meeting, yeah. uh, Nick there were a couple of changes to it, but I included the Arrow Street proposal to see what happened yeah. in context. Of okay. Um, so for uh, you two, well, you must definitely no, know this. You might change the work between the version they saw and the version that. Uh, no, I know this and note that. Like, no, you can pick up that mic. Just note that um, the proposal is included for reference, but that does not go to the MSBA. The contract alone is really what we're going to execute. Okay. In that con in that contract, did that contract change from what the one was no. that I ran through in the last? No. Okay. Um, and for Mike, I think you already know this. You probably know it anyways because you've been here long enough for other school projects. But the M this contract that we're being asked to sign based on the communication I got from the MSBA is basically a specified contract. I you you got to choose the other. Yeah, you got to choose who who receives the contract in terms of who gets hired, but the actual terms of the yes, contract are specified. So it's not standard. Really the only thing we're allowed to negotiate is fee. So uh, as opposed to if we eventually get to the construction contract that's a different Okay. I, would, I would also note, just to uh, put it in a uh, cover letter I put together, <coughs> the only fee that we've come to agreement on is for the architectural services. Mm -hmm. There's a whole series of supplemental services that we continue to work through scope, and um, those would be applied and they'll come in front of you as contract amendments to this contract. So there were like three different proposals that were in the package. It wasn't just a single one. Are those the ones that would come to us, or are they already incorporated in this contract? They are not incorporated. It was, this is just for. Uh, just for. I should say, I haven't seen what they're put in front of you, so um, I have. I have the uh, the original. Um, I'm not sure what got okay. circulated to you, so I, I should. There were like three or four. Um, ones I recall might have been for site services of some type. Niche. Uh, I just so site, yeah, site so survey has not been finalized okay. and um, has not been agreed to certainly by me or the school board. Okay. Um, so all we're asking for tonight is approval of the, the base contract services, okay, which is for Arrow Street, and they they have a series of uh, design team members, mechanical engineers, all sorts of um, civil engineers. Um, 
The, then there's what's called supplemental services. So those will be things like hazmat surveys, mm -hmm. um, as we search the building, the existing building. Um, that will be traffic studies if needed, site surveys. Um, I think those are the three. That Geotech is the other one. So we may possibly do some borings needed to determine the, the, uh, the soils, mm -hmm. uh, depending on which site we uh, narrow it down to. Um, so those have not come. We have not agreed upon those as of yet as a building committee. Um, so we're not presenting those for approval tonight. Those would be amendments. Okay. There may be proposals in there, but that does not mean we're asking you to execute those. The only proposal we're looking to execute and do a contract is the base fee for our Okay. Any questions? No, I went over this um, with the building committee. Uh, the building committee meeting. I had some questions and concerns about it. I was talking to the comments and applications. But I enjoyed reading through the contract. <coughs> Right. Uh, the one question I have right now, the agenda item says selectmen are, requ are requested to vote to sign, but I think it's just the chair that's required to sign. For some reason, I thought it was just the chair that signed. Well, you'd vote to, you'd vote, maybe authorize the chair to sign, but it would be, it'd still have to be voted for. No, I understand that. I, it, when the MSBA sent me the personal email informing me that I, ne I needed to sign the contract, and the contract needed to be exactly what they said, it's like they said all the kinds of things that caused me to get my guard up. <laughs> uh, just outside. I was paying a lot of attention to the, the directive nature of, uh, you know, if they'd been nicer about it, I probably wouldn't have been quite so. Uh, well, the contract is probably yeah. the see his signature line. Is. Yeah. Uh, it's typically the chairman of the board, so I can have signs. This was it's direct. typical of the MSBA contracts. There's only room for one signature on this document. Anybody else who want to be the owner? I would move then that we authorize the chair to sign the MSBA contract for base fee for the architectural services for Arrow Street Architects for the Dale Street Elementary School Project. I would make a friendly I would vote to uh, vote to execute it and authorize the chair to sign. Thank you. Which should not be confused with voting to execute the chair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very careful about the wording of these <laughs> motions. I guess I second. <laughs> we have a question. Is what I mean. How do I vote? <laughs> All in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. Done. Uh, let's see. Next, Dale Street Building Committee requests the board selectmen to vote to appoint Dr. Jeffrey Marsden and Ms. Anna May O'Shea Brook to the Dale Street Building Committee as voting members. So let me give you the background on this one. Um, as you probably recall, when we formed the committee in May of 2018, um, we had, I think, only five voting members at the time. We then added two more when it was made and that. Um, and the other one was Leo Graham as the school committee representative. And Leo's work schedule has gotten complicated over the course of the last six months or so. And so he's had a hard time being at all of the meetings. And so the school committee wanted to make sure they always had somebody at the meetings and participating in, in voting in the meetings. And so they asked to have NMA added. Um, in addition to Leo, so Leo would stay on there as well, which would bring us to eight members. Um, and our um, our owner's project manager had some odd feel about having an even number of committee members. Uh, I think it's highly, highly unlikely we're going to have some divided four to four vote. Um, however, in that you know one in a thousand chance, then if you're appointing somebody to the committee for the purpose of breaking the tie, that creates all sorts of complications about appointing that person. Breaking the tie, especially if it's somebody who's not necessarily participating. And so they asked to add a ninth member to the committee, and so Dr. Marsden's already on the committee as a non voting member. Um, and looking at other towns with their building committees, the superintendent is typically a, a voting member of the, of the building committee. So for quorum purposes, um, to add him as a voting member, he's always there anyway. Um, 
And so that would make sure, it would help us with the quorum and give us an odd number of members. And so and hopefully Anna May and Leo will be there together. I think part of it is that they'll be coming. And that's kind of the origin of this. And I know uh, Chris had raised the concern about the permanent planning and building committee bylaw. The two different committees, so the bylaw doesn't apply. It's a separate committee. So I checked that. And so that's not an issue with this. So. If I could add just um, my actual paying job, I, yeah, <laughs> we manage school projects and four of our um, four elementary school projects we have right now. Uh, the superintendent is a board member of Ashland, Wellesley, uh, Westwood. And, yeah, I think it's so for people that are watching or the general public or people who just have an innate curiosity about the nuances of rules and regulations, as I've come to understand this issue around resident needing to be, uh, you know, be, ha, ha, in order to be voting, you need to be in certain circumstances, which I gather does not apply in this particular circumstance. Uh, the, the concept is that if you're going to be in a position where you're going to make decisions that have to do with the taxes that people pay, then you should be a resident of the town paying those taxes in order to do that. So some of our some of the places where that applies, at least as I understand it, that's the rationale that was behind it. Uh, it's not a bad rationale. Uh, when I first joined the Board of Psych, when we had the ALS Study Committee, we seemed to have drifted into almost thinking that anyone outside of town couldn't serve on the committee. Unfortunately, we ignored, we, we didn't ignore it, we just rejected that, and that's how we got some pretty good members on the ALS Study Committee. So uh, that's the sensitivity. That sensitivity does not apply in this particular set of circumstances. Well, and so the permanent planning and building committee in the bylaw mm -hmm. required in that field. Right. Right. Uh, Chris, do you want to follow up? There's no general requirement of the charter, <coughs> and then you look to the individual bylaws, and this is basically directly from the state statute, the state statute. That you have to, and regulations that you have to set up this separate building. Okay. Um, uh, Chris Potts, 7 Curve Street. I was just in the actual um, town bylaw itself. There was a, a note in there that, um, I didn't write with me, unfortunately, there was a note in there that specified the type of public building projects and the codes that made it seem like that regardless of, of the overarching titles that any project that fell under those public building projects, that that bylaw, town bylaw, would apply. Um, I think the other part of it, too, is that in some of these towns, if you look at their specific bylaws, I mean, MSBA says in their letter for the appointments, um, that they're assuming that the town is going to be abiding by their own specific bylaws. So like in Westwood, for example, they have a special committee bylaw, which would necessarily would, would be a different bylaw than what Medville would have or what Naval would have. I think you have to look at everybody's different town bylaws. But what confused me on our town bylaw was the fact that there was reference to any building project that had to comply to these specific these specific mass general laws, this bylaw applied to. So that was why. Right, but that that doesn't govern the composition of the committee. It's a different committee. But it said in the bylaw that you could not be. If you're the on the if you're on the permit, so building. Um, okay. yeah. Since I wrote those bylaws, um, I just wanted to add that the and, I, and my memory is also not always perfect, so I'm happy to look back at them again, but. Um, the makeup of the permanent building committee requires that. Uh, the charter also requires that um, those types of projects are under the purview of the permanent building committee as well, except what I believe it's, you know, we don't have a choice in terms of the, the MSPA's makeup of a different committee, uh, but all members of the permanent building committee are on the school building committee. So, uh, but in the composition of this Dale Street School Building Committee, dictated by the state. Right? Correct. But the people who are on it have to be on it. And right. The proceed on it. And oh. that, right? So it's required to be. It's required to be. So I think if, if that doesn't comply with the permit plan. They we'll specifically rejected our, our original position, which was we already have a permanent school building committee, which will supervise this project. And they flat out said, no, you're going to form a separate committee as required by our regulation. No. So, uh, 
based on everything I've heard here, it sounds like it's appropriate for us to, if we're inclined to, to go ahead and approve this request. And Chris, I appreciate your diligence in digging into these things. Uh, this particular case, it doesn't sound like we we have to not do it. Uh, if some subsequent information were to come up that says, hey, this is something that just can't be done, then we deal with it. But at this point, I think we've heard enough that we can move ahead. Then it's going to be bad news for Michael Luffin, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you can move out of town between now and then. <laughs> okay. I just also just sort of relate to this. Um, it's MSB is, is awesome. They are such a great resource because they actually, you know, if you're even as a private citizen, they encourage you to call and ask questions. So one of the questions that I had asked, um, reached out to them and asked was, I think that there is confusion in general. Uh, you know, I first asked, do you have guidelines in terms of the chains of commands that these projects typically follow in terms of school committee, when does school committee make certain decisions, and when does the Board of Selectmen make decisions? Because Board of Selectmen is actually appointing, you know, this, this has appointed this committee and appoints the new members who are signing the contract for Arrow Street. But yet, the school committee also is charged with making certain specific decisions regarding this project. So is there any kind of um, outline or guideline that basically says, you know, what are the chains of command with these are the decisions that school committees typically make, these are the decisions that board of selectmen make, and MSBA said, no, that doesn't exist. <laughs> so I think it's, I think each project seems to be different, and might, might be able to, to say. And, you know, MSBA basically said, we look at this as being a very just a collaborative project, but I think that it's probably helpful project by project for the committees, the committee, school committee and, and district building committee and selectmen to actually have a conversation and say, okay, can we map this out? You know, so we can basically, so we basically know, you know, who's making what decisions. Um, I'll give you an example. So uh, there was a subcommittee that was voted on by the Dale Street Building Committee, and it was the Educational Programming Subcommittee. This Educational Programming Subcommittee was comprised of basically all educated, except for maybe one or two exceptions. In my mind, um, that educational subcommittee probably should have been appointed by the school committee because it's an educational programming subcommittee versus the building committee, um, just by the nature of what their, their charge seems to be. So I just think like that's just, that jumped out at me as why is the building, Dale Building Committee approving that appointment versus the school committee. So, does that make sense? I understand the question. I think part of it is that it seems to be the MSBA process is to create this sort of special committee that is kind of a focal point or kind of the coordinating point of the project. And it has you know, had representation from this board. It's got representation from the school committee. It's got kind of everybody you know, who has particular interest in the project. I understand the question on that point, and I think it's the educational programming as it relates to the design of the building, mm -hmm. as opposed to, oh, uh, yeah, you, you, you know this stuff. Uh, so, the educational visioning subcommittee that we formed as part of the discussion of this process, the MSBA process, um, is not there to make policy decisions. Um, they're there to facilitate the process to extract information from the educators who run our schools. Uh, so, and they're not, they also don't have any decision making authority. It's really just facilitating the process of discussion. The school committee absolutely is involved. In terms of um, what, who should be deciding what, um, the school building committee, of course, directly to the selectmen, uh, but the, as the real decision making authorities, we recommend stuff in front of you in terms of major decisions that need to happen. School committee will set policy on um, key things like the big thing, biggest thing is grade configuration. Um, and that's been put on their agenda for at least a minimum of three meetings in the upcoming months. Um, the school building committee will not be deciding what the grade configuration is. We do not set that policy. We are here to facilitate the process and make sure decisions are made by appropriate authorities. Uh, but we are not the authority when it comes to setting a uh, vision for our schools that like should come from the school district and the school committee. Uh, we're here to just make sure that that happens. Can I just ask one question? Okay, 
So when I look at the milestone um, schedule, there are probably three or four different groups that are referenced. And so there's a working group, there's an educational vision and working session, there's a building performance workshop with the energy committee, there's a, and then there's the building committee, and then there was a separate subcommittee that was officially voted on by the building committee. And that subcommittee is not referenced anywhere in this schedule. So I guess as just as an average citizen, I wouldn't know who is who, what role each one of these various groups is playing. Because they're referenced in the schedule, but there's no there's no like glossary that says this division group is tackling this topic. This subcommittee that was voted on with 11, 11 people that, that the superintendent brought for a vote, that's not listed on here. So it's just confusing who is who is weighing in on the various decisions as this project moves along. And I think that's just, I think it would help the community have some clarity on, uh, on what all these different groups are and the role that they're playing. So at this point, when I got the Chris's email, I clicked on the link and I looked at the bylaw and I just immediately said, oh, well, Jeff can't be, the superintendent can't be a board member. Didn't look to see what the, the section was. I just assumed that was going to be it. Are you sure that the... So I read the bylaw, right? I've read the bylaw before. As I read the bylaw... In the context of the bylaw? The bylaw applies to the permanent planning building membership. and the membership of the permanent planning building committee. The Dale Street School Building Committee is not the permanent planning building. Right. So, I mean, the current planning committee has five members, um, and... I didn't, I didn't realize that distinction. Right? Yeah, I and mean, I read it, I mean, I, I read it, because again, again, this is, I mean, this is really not a substantive, this is not going to make a substantive difference in anything. I mean, this is to make sure we have a quorum with somebody who's going to be there anyway, and, and can be consistent with what other tenants do. And so, um, and so I read it, and obviously it was the case, if, if, if he couldn't be on there, then Mark Francesco would be on there, and then be it, so easy, but... Um, I don't think the two committees are the same, um, and so um, I don't think the, the bylaw of the composition of the permanent planning and building committee affects the composition of the Dale Street Building Committee because that's dictated by state statute. And I asked Mark I didn't to really look at it, it, so I think Mark, you... It, it's uh, exactly as has been explained. I worked uh, with Mike on that bylaw and tweaked it, and the, it's, it relates to the membership of that committee. And if that's, that's not who has control of this project, and if that's not because we made a conscious choice, because the state told us, you know, okay, what you have in place that don't have in place, you're going to set up a new building committee for this project, and this is how it's going to be done. So I would move to appoint uh, Dr. Jeffrey Marsden and uh, Anna May O'Shea Brook to the Dale Street Building Committee. Uh, second. All in favor? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, Dr. Martin's running on it. Just to note, all of this needs to go through the MSBA as well. So uh, <laughs> we have to send it to them saying that we voted. Usually they are, you know, they leave the town to their own composition of the, the, the outside of the, the statutory ones. As long as you get all the people on the thing, <laughs> it's just the reality. To Chris's point about the different organizations and committees, I know that, I know that there's plans for educational sessions in the public and I would take that as feedback that maybe part of what would help for the public to understand for those who are interested enough to show up for the educational sessions would be to address here's how we're configured so that that would that would be right. Mm -hmm. I'll have I'll have the team start to pull something together but I, I would know so that it, it does get confusing. There's a lot going on. Um, some of which is is public based and some of which is not because there's we just can't have Huge public forums all the time. So we have we have forums that involve educators. We have forums that involve administration. We have forums that involve the public. Um, so we'll try to put some clarity to what's what, so that it gives a little bit more information. Yeah, I think I think the, the concept of a glossary is a good idea. Just to say yeah. here's who's doing what. Here's who's on these committees. I mean, I think it's. I mean, I. I um, the, the formatting of the flow chart is, is I have a little trouble following it just because everything kind of is diff different colors and I know um, so that would be helpful just to say one sentence you we know, already have that um, timeline that they did and it's almost like you can drop it right in the timeline for that question. 
Can I just make a friendly request? Can we get the minutes when the meeting is posted on the town website? Okay. They've been posted by the schools on their website. I don't know if the, what the logistics are around reference. I thought there was a link from the town website to the school website. No? Yeah, they haven't been sent to me post. So, yeah. I thought they were on the Dale Street, the, the page, the Dale Street building. They, the you, I don't, I, I haven't coordinate with the checked on it myself recently, but, yeah. um, but I know that, yeah, all of the minutes that have been voted and approved should, should be sent, and I believe the schools have been uploading them to the website, but, and there was going to be a link from the town website to the school website, just so we don't have duplication. Next, the select. This is another one of these ones that's just like really fun. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, Selectman are requested to vote to authorize Chairman Murphy to sign the initial boundary validation program for uh, form relating to the 2020 census. Now, I'm, I'm trying to fully grasp what this is, particularly the perambulation part of it. I think that we should seriously consider like a perambulation Saturday that the entire public is invited to join the selectmen and walk in the boundaries of Medfield. Uh, we're up for that, it would be, be good. But then as I read the instructions here, not only is there a boundary validation program, but there's also conducted in parallel with the 2020 boundary and annexation survey. So you're kind of about getting Willis back in the, I'm thinking that, no, is that some form of expansion? Willis would commend me first. You're going to have to find out with that. No, I, I'm just I'm thinking. I'm up my, my so, Medfield foreign policy. <laughs> so if anyone out there has any particular bodies of land that are contiguous to Medfield that you think we should seriously consider annexing, you need to let me know by March 1st. <laughs> uh, March 1st, yeah. So I have to submit that by March 1st, so probably give me a couple of days to work through it. But, so, uh, so Gus, in, in, in that regard, my favorite one that I think I heard about was, and this must have been from Mike Sullivan, he's the only person that would go to this sort of thing, but I think that the bridge on Route 27 going into Sherbrooke, both sides of that bridge are in that field. Hmm. Probably from an earlier annexation effort, but we don't know that. I don't remember why that is. But <coughs> We got to collect the tolls and the ferry that went across the Yeah, mm -hmm. we're on both sides of it. Well, anyway, I anxiously await your approval of my ability to sign the initial boundary validation program form. So you want to authorize our AGO to sign the BVP? For <laughs> 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 oh, it's this form. How does it relate to the BAS? I second that, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Tribal Aye. chairs Aye. and highest elected officials. Final opportunity. This, this is the only initial boundary, so I assume there could be further boundary discussions. Further boundary things. All right, just let me know when you're ready to start perambulating. Okay. Uh, FY21 budget. Uh, so these are the routine placeholders. Anything on the annual capital budget? Yes, I'd like to go over a few things with you. You're getting your, your budget packet tonight. Um, I just want to give you a, an update on the process. I know we've talked about this in bits and pieces over the last few months, um, but we have the department heads submit their budgets directly to the financial team, directly to Nick and I, beginning in August. Uh, Nick and I met with all the department heads uh, through September and October, and we started to make some of the changes uh, that we had been looking at. For example, all the administrative assistance that were in the town administrator's budget, making the town administrator's budget greater than a million dollars, uh, has been changed. Now every administrative assistant you'll find in the budget for the department they actually work in. So, um, it makes it a little difficult to look at uh, percentage increases when you're looking at the budgets because we have made some of the changes. Although I will say mine is 62% less than last year, so I would like some credit for that. Um, we're also moving all of the facility costs for the buildings, heating, electricity, and gas to the facilities budget. Um, in terms of monitoring that, especially where Amy is working with the Energy Committee on efficiency and savings, it makes more sense for her to be reviewing those bills and paying them than the individual departments. Um, so it's another change you'll see in the packet you have tonight. Um, some of the changes are still in process and you'll see them before we finish this. Uh, one of the ones we've talked about but we're working through some changes in newness is separating out 
water and sewer from the operating budget. It will be its own warrant article this year, and you'll only see the allocated costs coming from water and sewer back under revenue on our budget. Uh, but that'll be voted separately. Uh, that is how most towns do it. I'm not sure how we ever kind of started commingling them together, but it did make it very interesting uh, in trying to dissect the budget last year. And obviously one of our goals is to make the budget more transparent. So uh, that's one of our first steps. Um, I do want to caution you when you're reading your budget packet tonight. It's a similar guidance that I gave to the Warrant Committee uh, a few weeks ago. This is a preliminary budget. And we'll start to put these online. We're redesigning how we're showing them to you. So things are going to look very different than they have in the past. Um, these are preliminary budget numbers. They don't include um, actual numbers for our health insurance, which obviously is one of our biggest budgets, property and liability, uh, and the police budget we're still working on. So you'll see some changes to those as we go along. Um, we've been given estimates from our insurance carriers with their maximum amounts. So we should have some positive results. Uh, in the next month or so, but unfortunately it just doesn't time up with our budget cycle. Um, this budget also does not include um, collective bargaining agreements with police and fire. Those are in process. It does not include a COLA or merit for any of our non-union personnel. It assumes a 4% increase in the school department budget. And our principal and interest budget can't be finalized until we make some decisions on how we're going to do the capital stabilization fund and if we're going to move forward on that. Um, this budget also utilizes $500,000 in free cash. Um, when I say to balance the budget, but as of today and looking at this, we're still, in using that $500,000, still have a $700,000 deficit, deficit in this budget. Um, we're hoping that will swing more positive our way. I don't think we're going to be able to get that down to zero. Um, so we're going to have to have some uh, policy discussions as we move forward. This budget, as of today, does not meet um, the budget policy of the selectmen adopted. Given our conversations with Moody's and their stern warning to us this summer, I think it's imperative that we meet that budget policy. I don't think we have an option, especially in year two. Um, so to do that, we're going to have to make some hard decisions on what we move forward on uh, in terms of budgeting. So when you say it doesn't meet the policy, is that in terms of contributions to various reserve accounts? So we have, this budget reflects those contributions to those accounts. It does not meet it in our reserve fund policy and our free cash right now. Okay, we're using more free cash than we said we wanted to use. So we need to, we need to look at um, changes that we're literally updating this um, almost on an hourly basis. Um, in fact, we waited till uh, almost six o'clock to print it for each night as we're getting more information in. So it's a, it's a work in progress. But um, Nick's also, also done a great job of putting together a lot of historical information in your budget packet, something that I don't think we've seen uh, before altogether in one place. So it'll also make it uh, easier to understand how we're doing. Um, but I think tonight, I think the most important thing we need to decide is are we going to move forward with the capital budget stabilization fund? There was some concern after the last meeting. Um, one of the recommendations that Mike had made is that we fund the debt service for the fire trucks out of the capital stabilization fund. There was some pushback initially from a few people that that was not allowable. We had a fantastic conversation with the deputy director of DOR, who not only was supportive of that um, fund, but thought it was a very creative way. And one of the reasons why they created the Municipal Modernization Act was for towns to start doing creative things like this. He thinks that, same as we do, it makes us more accountable to the voters to do a fund like this. His only caveat was we need to talk to bond council. They may have some concerns with it. Um, our conversation with the bond council, they, um, they're fine with moving forward on it. They did caution us. There are some IRS regulations that may impact that. Um, but it was not, it, we were not discouraged in any way from doing it. We would just maybe have some more restrictions that we had in the past. So I think the, 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 the two pieces of the, because we had looked at like three or four different scenarios. And this was, I don't think this was the scenario we actually had laid out, um, which was to, to create the stabilization fund, but not have a separate bond issue for the fire trucks. In other words, we would have a bond issue for the fire trucks, but we would pay that out, out of the initial allocation from the, the capital stabilization fund. So it would be a 20-year, 20-year? 20 20-year 20 20 bond, so it would be, you know, about, starting at about, 80,000 in the first year? Yeah, just about 76, 76 in the first year. 76 in the first year, and then going down. Correct. If we advertise the principal over 20 to 50 per year, so we 
take up about you know, seventy-five thousand out of a let's say million dollar capital composition of the fire trucks. So you then you would not have a separate. You know, mm -hmm. Just like with and the good news with this as well is that when we were working on the building stabilization plan, as you may know, we had this big roof project that's sort of coming down um, the pipe. Sort of, um, Mike right here, he'd say, was over our heads. Hey, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, this roof project coming down the pike in a few years. Um, and so I think in the last iteration of the capital plan, we had budgeted that we would pay the debt service on the roof project. It's about a $14 million project. So you can, right? It's 14. Yes. So That's the rough estimate. Right? Rough estimate. So you obviously can't do that out of the stabilization fund in one year, but if you did over 20 years, you could pay it. So you're not actually going back to the taxpayers for additional building projects. So that's good news. So it would be the same concept with the fire trucks. We'd have one vote to create the stabilization fund and the revenue stream would pay the debt back. So. Yeah. 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 Sounds like it makes sense to me. So, so I, I like to simple, keep a simple picture which is should be viewed as overly accurate or even overly stable. But what I what I what I hear right now, and this is not where we're going to wind up, but in terms of what's our challenge, uh, I don't know whether I don't, we don't have the capital stabilization fund amount. But in my head, I've just rounded it off to a million dollars. Uh, so we're talking about a capital override of a million dollars. And then on top of that, we currently have a seven hundred thousand dollar excess above prop two and a half limits without things like merit and uh, bonus pools and things like that. Uh, and I'll again round that up to another million dollars. And basically, you know, at this with the fifty thousand foot level view, half of that is something we're kind of asking taxpayers to deal with and the other half of it is something that we have to try off the hard to make completely go away. And I don't think we make it completely go away by zero increases and stuff. I mean, that's I actually, even though we don't have numbers in there yet, I think for practical purposes, we ought to plan some numbers in there because planning against the scenario that says, yeah, we just think everybody's not going to get a raise and stuff. You know, for our planning purposes. Yeah, and uh, we have yeah. those numbers, they're just not included in this okay. packet that you received tonight. Okay. Uh, at this point, Early January, it's a bit bigger than a red box, smaller than a barn kind of number. So, okay. The people listening out in town should not panic. The number is not a final number, it's yeah. just kind of Very the size of the nut we're working on right now. Good. Uh, anything else? Time to do more articles? Well, I think Mr. Steen is looking for us to decide what we're going to do on the capital stabilization. Yes, um, where we're at the end of January, I'm concerned that if we don't start moving forward with an official stance on the capital stabilization fund, we won't have enough time to explain to people. In terms of the article itself, are we? Sorry, yeah, okay, sure. So if, you, if you're supportive of it, I know we're going to all be at the Warren Committee next week. The Warren Committee has heard uh, this discussion. They were just waiting to hear what DOR said as well. Mm -hmm. um, we'll start going out to do some public hearings and start talking to people um, how it works and how we're talking about funding. So, so to that point, from my point standpoint, at least, A, I like what we're trying to do, which is become more proactive and more disciplined around our capital spending. Uh, I think when we talked before, the view was let's set this at a level that we can actually set the expectation of the town that this is where the capital funding is going to come from. And so we're going to live with it. Uh, and, and I think the one interesting nuance is this idea of being able, if, if we can use financing, then it may Given that we're just starting it, it may actually help us leverage our way up to some more stable balance that we can do what we want with in the future. So, uh, I'm, on, I'm on board with this, re even recognizing it's an override, and that some we, what we talked about was trying to find other places where there was capital in the operating budgets to pull that out to use for contributions to reserves and things like that, which obviously is adding to the pain on the operating side. So this budget does not include um, what we were talking about as a plan B. So this budget does not include any room in it for, obviously, a $700,000 deficit. does not include any room for capital budget. So if we do not pass the capital stabilization fund, that is not included in here. That's a policy discussion we're going to have to have uh, as we move forward as well. I don't, I don't think we can go a second year without no. funding capital. I think we've got some safety issues that need to be addressed. No, look, I think if, if 
if it didn't pass it at town meeting, we'd have to have an amendment to be able to amend it, or if it didn't pass the ballot box, we'd have to recall town meeting back after the election to cut other stuff from the budget to I think overall, from the accountability standpoint, it's happened. The fire trucks are sort of the latest example of a major capital expense that was there, that existed, but there was nowhere right. reflected in any of our financial plan. Right. Right. And, then, and you end up with, it was a little bit connected to the point I made with the council meeting earlier. So we spend the money now, if you pretend that there are a bunch of other expenses that aren't there, and then those expenses come up, well, of course we have to put a roof in the schools, right? You can easily see that situation. Well, we know we have this roof project, but let's just not mention it and spend money on other stuff because we know that the town will vote to put a roof over the heads of the kids. And meanwhile, you've spent the money, which is true, right? We're not going to have the kids rain them. But then you spent the money on something else that really should be prioritized. For so I think the, 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 the carrot and the stick are kind of the two pieces of this. Yeah, you're creating the additional revenue stream, no question about it. But we are having, going to have a more disciplined approach to capital budget so that and this amount that we're spending on capital, if we were incurring these liabilities all along, they didn't really reflect in the tax rate anymore. Right? It's like anything else, it's like any other long term liability. You have the liability, you're just not funding it, so it's not reflected in the tax rate. Right. And you have a surprise situation like we had a few years ago with the football field, um, which again, that football field was deteriorating for a really long period of time. And the new administration came in and suddenly realized, you know, we have to play the football field, but there's no planning for the 15 years before that. What's going to happen with the turf wars? <laughs> so hopefully, um, with this approach and with knowing how much money is there and no more, it will force people to get in line quick, as opposed to holding back, making more course for jump on there and spend this money. Um, and so I think it's one of the things in the long run we can do to kind of mitigate some of the hidden long-term liabilities of the So what you're saying sort of raises an issue that, that I've been grappling with, which is what is the proper level of capital spending? And it seems to me that the figure that I've heard uh, at the town of Arlington seems to have been a uh, well-planned out capital budget plan that we've had in the past few years. And I think they're spending a quarter or 5% of their operating budget, which is way more than we're proposing to be here. Mm -hmm. What's different about their? Uh, obviously, they're doing the same things we're doing, so we can make the different items that they've got in the budget. Yeah. So that would be my concern. Is that that's combined, combined capital budget, including water and sewer? Does it include like debt service? Like, it, if you measure debt mm -hmm. service mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. buildings, mm -hmm. then we're probably up there because you include the amount of we're spending on the public safety building, the garage, the still the schools, the other stuff. I mean, that's you add that to this part of it, then we get up over five percent. Yeah. So. We can take a look at I agree with the whole concept that Mike just ran through. Totally agree with it. The thing that I think harder about, though, is that when we do this, I mentioned this before, when we move all these kinds of spending categories out of the discretionary stoop that we have had in the past where you could choose to not fund capital in order to ease the pain of operating budgets where we are going we're going down a path which i also agree with where we're isolating the operating budgets and aside from the capital spending and the proactive spending that we've got here we are putting the microscope on growth and true operating costs and I'm not necessarily suggesting that searing pain has to be imposed in a single year, but I do think that what we're going to find is there will be pain of some to some degree for however you know however low the pain is in any given year, there'll be continuing pain for a number of years until it all gets run out of the system. But we have to learn how to live mm -hmm. on the operating side within reasonable affordability growth, uh, and this will make it harder to kind of mask that with trading off long-term costs for short-term operating costs. Okay. Uh, anything on town meeting warrant articles above and beyond that? Nope. Um, I will, I, I don't have a date with me on top of my head uh, when we're going to close the warrant when we stop accepting warrant articles. But if anybody has any warrant articles, please reach out to us as soon as possible. Have you heard enough from us about the capital 
override to be comfortable, you know where we all fit, right? <coughs> um, MSH Development Committee, the only item I have there, our next meeting is scheduled for 6 p.m. on Jan Monday, January 27th. A little hard to get everybody together. Um, we still need to get the notice out for new members, and if it was just the wording involved, actually, in my court to take it back to that wording. So, uh, town administrator update. So I have a, a couple of things. One, I want to give you a town clerk update. Um, so I've been in contact with uh, the town clerks association and several town clerks in our area, um, as well as our del um, legislative delegation. Uh, we are not the only one experiencing this. There are several towns who have had town clerks leave either mid-cycle or have decided not to run at the last minute for election. Uh, it's a very busy election year. Um, so interim town clerks are in high demand. I actually have an interview. It's funny. Everybody I've talked to kept recommending this one town clerk. Um, and I'm actually meeting with him at 3.30 tomorrow. He thinks working in Medfield will be fantastic. Um, he's been an interim in seven other towns and has served anywhere from three weeks to 18 months. So he didn't think a year would be outside of what he'd be willing to do. Uh, I'm meeting with him tomorrow, and I have another town clerk uh, I have a phone interview with tomorrow, later tomorrow afternoon as well. Um, as we discussed, uh, your recommendation and your wish was to have two, uh, well actually doesn't give me a number, uh, existing town employees uh, to be appointed as town clerk. I'm recommending that Dolores Connors in the treasurer's office and Marion Benaldi from the Planning and Zoning Office be appointed as assistant town clerks. You don't have to move for that. Just, yeah. Does Carol actually have to appoint them? Or? No, I think assistant town clerks can be appointed by the Board of Selectmen, okay. uh, especially in her, in her absence, but I can confirm that. Yes. Okay, so make sure that. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, do we have a last day, Carol? Uh, I believe it's February 14th. Okay. So she will be here to certify the signatures for my understanding she will do that and has taken uh, the first steps for the election uh, the presidential process. Did I make a good date? Uh, yes. Just a quick one. Thanks. Uh, Nate Bazinet, 30 Oriel Road. Um, having volunteered in the town clerk's office this year and especially uh, Last year also, in the past few weeks, um, I'd like to note that I'm in favor of appointing the, uh, the two assistant town clerks. Um, with that in mind, as we know, it's a busy 2020 election year with uh, federal primaries March 3rd, uh, town elections March 30th, uh, state primary September 1st, and the uh, federal and state elections on November 3rd. Um, that's in addition to the May 4th, our first uh, May um, annual town meeting, as well as a possible special town meeting. and. Uh, who knows regarding uh, you know further uh, budget things meant to call it back for. Um, I'll just say that uh, the friendly residents, former residents and business owners I've met and who, who sought the services of the town clerk have high standards and I know they expect a continuation of the timely and quality service being provided. Um, it bears noting that the current town clerk, as was just noted, was uh, is that she's leaving on February 14th, which is three and a half weeks out. So I think it's really great to have them being appointed in Mary and uh, Dolores kind of hitting the ground running before she's out of the office, clearly. Um, as the office of the town clerk is subject to state and federal regulations, uh, which is a town we have very little leeway with, and again, considering the high expectations of voters this particular election year, I think it's worth redrawing attention to these details and uh, thanking the board of selectmen, uh, the town administrator, and town staff for uh, their sense of urgency regarding it. Thanks. Thank you. If I could respond first, thanks for that gracious statement. Um, more importantly, as a selectman, thank you. Yeah, I, I, we're all aware how the volunteer time you put in sure, sure. the town clerk's office. It's very so, popular at the first floor. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know the candy. I don't know the candy. <laughs> well, no, I just would like to publicly thank you for the, the effort you've been putting in. Um, hoping that you'll continue to be willing to do that even with the, the additional people. But uh, it happened. It, it, it's been a, it, it's very obvious that you've been helping out the town a lot. I just appreciate it. I, I think the town really has an opportunity uh, during this year, and I know Nate feels the same way, to really expand the hours of the town clerk's office to be open the same hours of the town hall. So people can come get their nomination papers. We can get vitals when people aren't you know, working, and so we're really trying to, to increase that for this next year. 
and then I think we had a little bit of um, time to think about as well, kind of some of the responsibilities for committees and minutes and things like that, mm -hmm. and how that's been distributed on the first and second floor of town hall, and it might be a good chance to be distributed for the charter. Mm -hmm. Say, as to Mary, and I appreciate the minutes she does for the House of Trust meetings, and she's full of energy to answer some of the Evelyn and Christine out, so I think it's fair. Clara. Approve to approve the two of them? Yes, indeed. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I have two other things. I just wanted to let you know, uh, Eric Kaborkin, who is the program coordinator for Park and Recreation, has left for a new position. Um, and so we posted that position, and I believe Park and Recreation makes that appointment. We'll start interviewing in the next few weeks. Um, and I'm sad to announce that Georgianne Burlock uh, has announced her retirement uh, from the police department. Mm -hmm. So she'll be uh, leaving us within the next two weeks. We have posted that position as well. We're starting to look at um, how that will best be done. Um, let's see, consent agenda. We have several items here. One is Medfield High School Theater uh, Society requests permission to post signs February 28th to March 15th advertising their production of Into the Woods. The second item, resident Kristen Williams requests permission to hold the fifth annual Hunters Run to take place on Sunday, April 5th, 2020, beginning and ending at the Kingsbury Club Ice House Road. And uh, event planner Mark Walter requests permission to hold a fundraising bicycle ride through a part of Medfield on Saturday, September 26, 2020, to benefit the Michael Carter Lisnow Respite Center located in Hopkinton. The Council on Aging requests one day wine and malt beverage permits for the following events St. Patrick's Dinner, Wednesday, March 18th, 4 to 7 p.m., April Supper Club, Wednesday, April 22nd, 4 to 7 p.m. Chico's Fashion Show, April 1st or 15th at uh, TBD from 4 to 6.30 p.m. And the May Supper Club on Wednesday, May 20th, 4 to 7 p.m. Uh, the last item is Medfield Youth Hockey request permission to post signs to advertise a fundraising event. Medfield Youth Hockey throwback party to be held Saturday, February 1st, 2020 at the German Club Route 109, Walpole, Massachusetts. Uh, be before we move on those, I just had one quick question. Evelyn, I think you're the calendar keeper. When we get requests going all the way out to next September, are we sure there's no conflicts from anything else that happens in September? No, I think next, I think September 26th is Medfield. I'm going to say push it back. Yeah, because I, I think the third Saturday is Rosh Hashanah. It's just going to have it on one Saturday next year. So I think that may be Medfield. Not that you can't work bike right around it, but yeah. 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 they don't have to be in the center. Right, so we're going out through Pine Street. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as long as that's, that's, but I think that is, right, this was the sixth. Yeah, that would be the fourth Saturday. I think it's the fourth Saturday of June. It's not a trial. It was, uh, we said that night, it was 9.30 to 12.30. was when they expected to be at the town, which it's like mile, I was impressed, it's like mile 26 or something. And they start at 7.30. No, no, it's mile 52 or 53. They start at 7.30 and they're saying some people are going to be here at 9.30, which run like 26 miles an hour for two hours. Look at the Asta. They come in incredible. It's pretty <clears throat> impressive anyway. I did the math and I was like, no, people moving out. Um, but to your comment about September, you could dash it down. We can, we can add that to the selection action item list. We haven't had uh, no, we that's true. We haven't added 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 added. Added. the creation of a town calendar. They actually you know what it sounds to me? That sounds like a spectacular tool stuff. Mm -hmm. Creation of a town calendar, a way for people to submit things, right? They're all in the computers. Absolutely. Like the selection deflection list. The reassignment list. The reassignment <laughs> Okay. Uh, Can we move the uh, licenses and permits on the consent agenda? I second. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Okay. Uh, 
approval of minutes, June 4th, May 14th, and November 18th. So if we start with uh, June 4th, any comments on the minutes for June 4th? This is just a minor edit with the character. Yeah, LaSalle was misspelled. In LaSalle Village, we spelled like the college out in Illinois. Oh, this is LaSalle. Yeah. So I ended up on the court change. I'll give it to you just um, right there. So I had questions. <coughs> that was about my store that you were coming in. Yes, it was. Yeah, it's yeah. Right. Cafe. Yeah. No, it's Pete's store. It's yeah. store. The problem is that uh, uh, there was a cafe right next door to Pete's store, and the, uh, her cafe actually got enlarged, and Pete's store got oh. reduced. Yeah. Much to the dismay of residents, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, so do we have a motion to accept mm -hmm. June 4th as amended? Second. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Next one, May 14th. The only, I had one edit on this. Again, it's a minor one. It's, it's probably on the sixth page. Talking about the car wash. It says, Mr. Goy estimates 200 per car wash. I'd say cost of the town. I'll do that. Was that right with the uh, car wash? What did it, that was two hundred dollars. What the cost, cost of the water? We're talking about the water usage. For the car wash, is two hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. I was fascinated because yeah, I actually didn't remember him saying that. Yeah, I think he was giving an estimate. Um, uh, I had two corrections. Uh, uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's not new town. It's new in town. And it's kind of an odd spelling. And then uh, it's a, meant to a coalition, and it should have said meant to a foundation. So this one is more complicated to me, although one ironic thing is the car wash, the note that I wrote down is that we had talked about in the minutes that we were going to have a car wash policy in the past year, we haven't yet. We're working on it. So we should add it to the action. It's in the process. In the process. Uh, all right, here, this gets complicated uh, from May 14th. The content looks good, but the times the votes took place look wrong. So one option is just drop the times. But if you look at, we were extremely productive in the first 15 minutes of this meeting based on what it says here. So for instance, um, if you look at page two under action items, at approximately 7.02 p.m., Mr. Peterson made a motion to sign the municipal police training. So we have a motion to this in the meeting. I doubt that very much. Um, and I'm wondering whether some of those were, it might have been 8.02, but not 7.02. Uh, and then again at 7.02 p.m. Mr. Peterson made a motion to authorize Chairman Murphy to endorse. And then again at 7.02 p.m. we had discussed the 2019 rents for Hillside Village. So something's really weird going to on the Well, unless we took the action items ahead of the G-Video visit. This is what we should have asked. I don't know. I'll have to go back and look at the video. Okay. If, if it's definitely right, that's fine. I was just looking and saying that two minutes into a meeting we were doing this stuff. There's no requirement even before the time. So maybe we just take out the time. So that, that didn't use this up. Um, and, uh, this is just a comment on page five. We agreed that we'd have a lot three discussion with it. So we haven't done that yet. So it's just uh, a note to myself. Also, I didn't say which summer. <laughs> <laughs> or which lot three. <laughs> 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 uh, then on page five. Uh, very last item, Isaac Popper, I'm not even going to tell you the ways it was spelled, but Isaac Popper's name, Eagle Scout, was spelled wrong in several different ways. So it should be P-O-P-P-E-R. So if we could clean that up. Um, <laughs> And then page eight, let me see, let me see, there was a typo in the first paragraph. So it was five, six, seven. I had this all written down. I don't know where I put the page eight typo first paragraph. Uh, 
Oh, next to last, the last sentence, Mr. Ms. Trayweiler is not expecting a large amount of money, as opposed to a large amount of money. That was
Corey Starling or her husband saw the draft, the draft the RFP for that. So hopefully that's a move we'll ahead with uh, in the near term. Uh, on the collective bargaining side, um, we have meetings on Thursday with both the police and fire. This is the kickoff fire process, and then your proposal from the police. And so uh, I'll be in a position to update you further after um, we hear what we have to say on Thursday. I think we are still cautiously optimistic that we can get this done, have it as one article um, at the annual town meetings. For the police contract will definitely require a retroactive appropriation because the contract expired uh, last June. Um, so stay tuned on that. Um, we had an update already in the Dale Street Building Committee, but coming up on February 4th is the next uh, public community educational visiting uh, session that's ahead of our meeting. It's 4 to 8 p.m. open to the public. That's in the Dale Street uh, cafeteria. In the next meeting, the building committee is after our next meeting on twelve. I had something else, but I forgot what it was. So, uh, pass the baton to Pete. The uh, Metro Coalition for uh, Suicide Prevention uh, on the meeting, and they're working on having a walk that's going to happen on May third at the uh, Metro High School track. Runs from somewhere from one to. Um, and it's actually very interesting because it's, the, the, the process is being led by a, uh, a senior at the high school, really up there, a very, very confident lady. Um, Midfield Foundation uh, uh, met, and uh, there is no one stepping forward to win the volunteer awards and champion of this year, so they will probably skip to the volunteer awards this year. Uh, the Angel Run was very successful and raised a good uh, amount of money for the families in need in, uh, in town, provide a lot of fun for families, again, as always, and so that was a very successful event. The Metro Energy Committee is, is looking at, uh, continuing their looking at trying to help make the uh, development of the hospital a, a lower impact carbon footprint type of development, passive house or, or zero net, uh, net zero type of development. And they're looking at things that would, uh, would work there. Um, they're also considering some uh, some uh, uh, water. It's, you know, there's a feeling, among other things, that uh, if it's not a, an energy, at least a half-time energy uh, uh, manager, that they would more than save the cost of the, of the uh, salary of the person. I think that that uh, did we hear that at the uh, um, mm -hmm. meeting with the other selectmen? It's kind of whether it's that position or not. But, but there were a number of towns that said that they thought that they were saving more than saving the salary of the person they were paying. And I thought it was that kind of position. I'm not sure. I, I will say that the annual report they submitted with the projects that they have in the queue, if those projects are accurately portrayed, having somebody that could drive those would certainly cover their cost for a while. Mike was, Mike Sullivan used to quote the, uh, the energy savings that we've had since the after committee started work 10 years ago or so. And I think it was up around 40%. Uh, it's a lot of money every year. Uh, you, you guys haven't seen the annual, that annual green communities report. That's, um, I think I probably have a version of it, Christine, but you have. It is on the final one. It's on the final one. It's on the yeah, I would. I mean, you can't if you don't get there and you want it. It's it's it'll take you half an hour to read it. It's not a terribly. I was I was really, my eyes were open at how many things were going on and how much progress we've already made. Most of the initiatives that they've already done were kind of the zero or low cost to the town. Most of the initiatives that are coming up involve more money. It's just that a lot of that money comes from utilities or can come from grants, so it's not like it's true money. But even if the, even if the town did pay for any of those, the actual long, if you look at the long, you know, the payback is in a, a limited number of years. So just on a pure financial basis, it's pretty powerful, leaving aside all the environmental benefits that go along with it. So I, I, had, I had underappreciated. Um, the breadth of the efforts that the Green Committee had undertaken or, or the future efforts that they've identified. Uh, 
It was interesting because the, the Energy Committee actually saved the town a lot in terms of energy expenditures in the very first few years. And then when they decided to go for the green communities, what they had done was they had established an energy savings baseline that was low, and so that when they had to get 20% energy savings on that baseline, they had to do it because they already saved a lot of energy. Um, and then the last thing was the Atomic Master Planning Committee it hasn't been meeting, but we have subcommittees which are meeting and so that I uh, helped uh, work on the, I think it was the historical and cultural section of the, of the report. And that's it, Mr. Chairman. You have inputs on this college of the site? We did not. Um, but I can tell you that the report that I work on is very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, we don't have a whole lot to report over the last couple of weeks since our last meeting. Uh, the education working group that I mean, met before our last meeting will be meeting next week, and then they'll be meeting again on our first meeting in February. So I'll be bailing an hour early on that uh, for that last meeting that they have. Um, on the 27th of January, the, as I mentioned, the development committee is meeting at 6, and then the the school committee uh, is going to be presenting kind of a, a short uh, Dale Street project presentation at the Warren Committee meeting that night at 7.05, I think it is. So Anna May had suggested that perhaps it would make sense to brief the, the Board of Selectmen, or you already know she talked to me because I was at the Vision Committee and then also attended the Warren Committee. So it's, a, it's an information session, nothing formal, just trying to get both board committee and me and maybe you up to speed. Is that public safety board? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think you already told me that. Yeah. It's, I think the... Uh, training room with public safety. Training room with public safety, that's what it will be. Because it's the board committee. It's the board committee. Uh, I am going to post the board of selectmen since all three of you will be there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, he will. Oh, you won't be there. Well, will be there. Does that have to be there? Nope. No. You probably know all this. I may go for some time with that. If it makes it easier, I just promise not to talk about to Mike at this meeting. We'll really ignore each other. So it'll be like neither one of us was there. Um, on the 28th, that's the second education working group session, so I'll actually be able to make that whole one. On the 30th, there's a, so the 30th, that's the night that uh, Denise Scarlick has her annual report to the town. But it's also the evening that the school budget hearing is being held at the high school auditorium. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking I may go to that school budget hearing uh, and send Denise my regrets. But um, I think that's all. And then, uh, then again, the fourth. That will be the final uh, education work. So outside of that, I owe you guys an OPEB update. It's usually pretty simple. I just have them pulled together and we haven't gotten the committee together yet. Uh, I think I mean one other thing, but I can't think what it is. So, but that one's for sure is uh, still good news. It's not quite as good as last year, but it's still good news. All the numbers are going as good now. And that's it. Uh, informational items. Denise Garlic will present the report to the community Thursday, January 30th at 7.15 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. at the Public Safety Building, also in the training room. Uh, Representative Sean Dooley will hold annual office hours on Thursday, February 6th, from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. in the Town Hall Ward group committee room on the first floor at the front door. Uh, I guess I get to vote as the chair of the Board of Selectmen at the Mass... Oh, we didn't mention the Mass Municipal Association. Annual meetings coming up Friday and Saturday, and all three of us are planning to be there for all or part of it. Uh, so that's coming up. Um, we got, let's see, I don't think there's too much. Uh, we got an extra $41,000 in Chapter 70 funds. Chapter 90. Uh, I'm sorry, Chapter 90 funds. Uh, the notice that came out, I wondered, it said, oh, we've, we've come up with 10% more. So you've got I added to your 450000 I did the math and says, where's our other $4,000? But it's all good. Um, and I think that is about, any, about as good for anything that members of the public might be interested in. So, do we have anything else we need to talk about?
once or twice, twice, twenty three times. I second. All those in favor? Aye. Thanks for coming. You're watching Medfield TV.